All right, so our next item is the acknowledgement of land occupation. This is something I've been wanting to do for a few years. One of our members, Jason Cordova, brought this up several years ago. And when I became the president um, about two and a half years ago, I took up the uh, mantle of getting this done. So it's an honor to have members of the University of Denver Native Student Alliance with us today to acknowledge that we are living, working, and observing the night sky on their native land. So I would like to have you come up here so I can introduce you. John McCourse, Fiona Fitzpatrick, Lauren Roberts, Rosie Molina, Olivia Harrison, Hadley Bird Bear. Did I miss anybody? Come on up, all of you, please. And somebody has the microphone, right? Did it switched over? Oh, okay. All right. So I'm going to go sit down and enjoy this while you guys present. You guys need two microphones? Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you for being here. Yeah. Thank you so much for having us. My name is Fiona Fitzpatrick. I am the cultural chair for the Native Student Alliance at the University of Denver. Right. And I thank, thank you so much for having us here today. today. Um, we're so, so grateful to be here. So um, I'll just pass the mic down now. Uh, hi everybody, my name is John Course. Uh, I was asked to conduct a prayer prayer here this evening. So uh, I'm gonna do it first in Indian and then I'm gonna do it in English. Uh, I don't speak Indian, my grandpa does, so he gave me something to say. And um, even though probably no one here is gonna understand it, I just do that because the the land is used to hearing native language, it's not English. English hasn't been here for very long. So I'm gonna do that for the earth first and foremost. And then after I'm gonna do it in English. So if you guys want to take off your hats, um, and just want to join me very quickly. Uha amina, yonti amahu pita o kamiyadi, mo wa kame mei, kuba ni wan kuyi ni kula mei uwa yaki. Amele hu anum taiwana kuba anum kawa ifle o me famai siuki mo pi i ni uwa yaki. Amele hu mo kui wa no mai kima kawa i. Uh, creator, I just want to want to say thank you for this breath of life that you gave us this morning. Um, I just want to humbly express gratitude for everything that you give us in this life, and uh, I just want to ask that you give blessings to everyone in this room tonight, and whatever they're working on, to whether it be school or work or. Anything like that, just want to ask for blessings for everyone here. So, thank you. I hope. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Um, and I would just like to acknowledge that the Chamberlain Observatory, the University of Denver, and the greater Denver area rest on the homelands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Ute tribes. We also want to recognize the descendant communities of the Northern Cheyenne tribe of Montana, the Northern Arapaho tribe of Wyoming, the Southern Cheyenne and Arapaho tribe of Oklahoma, the Southern Ute Indian tribe, and the Ute Mountain Ute tribe. Since time immemorial, these tribes and some other 40 indigenous communities have continually worked to steward the land, water, and skies of the area we now call Colorado, even in the face of violence, displacement, and genocide. As we further our exploration of the stars and the heavens, it's important to remember the first scientists that stood on these lands and mapped these stars. As scientists, we need to recognize the importance of indigenous knowledge and the ways in which the legacy of colonialism has subverted and stolen this knowledge. As responsible citizens, we work to understand the true legacy of colonialism and dismantle systems of oppression, understanding how acts of violence against indigenous peoples occurred in this nation and these lands that we all work and live in. In particular, we need to remember the violent beginnings of Colorado and the University of Denver, the Sand Creek Massacre, and the consequences that still affect Cheyenne and Arapaho communities today. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate you all being here with us today. There it is. Okay. All right. Okay. Sorry for those at home. I didn't know that I had been muted. <laughs> I was just thanking our guests who were here. And uh, we will now go into the next part of the meeting. Um, all right. Um, so now we have a video from Bill Cast about the Astronomical League Observing Awards that were recently given to some of our members. Let me get that open and I will play it. Are we set up for all the video correctly on that and audio? Okay. Welcome. It's time to announce the Summer and Fall Quarter Astronomical League Observing Awards. These awards have been earned by members of the Denver Astronomical Society. As a DAS member, you are automatically enrolled as a member of the Astronomical League. Membership includes a subscription to the Reflector, quarterly journal of the AL. Also, as an AL member, you are eligible to participate in any of over 80 challenging observing programs. Successful completion of each program is rewarded with a certificate, and many programs include a nice enameled lapel pin. The name and club affiliation of each award winner is published in the Reflector. The summer issue of the Reflector recognized DAS member Jim Rasmussen for completion of the silver level of the Comet Observing Program. Here's Jim with his 9.5-inch Celestron AVX and DSLR camera on a go-to mount. He used this setup to document several of his observations. Photography is optional. Sketches may be used. Jim recorded the required observation of 12 different comets. A self-avowed comet chaser, I'm sure Jim is already working his way to the gold level, which requires observation of 18 additional comets. This is the certificate awarded to Jim for his work. And here's his lapel pin. Here's DAS member Ian Wymore, pictured here with his family. Ian was recognized in the fall 2023 reflector for completion of the Lunar Observing Program at both the regular and binocular levels. Ian used a 10-inch Dobsonian and 12 by 60 binoculars to make his observations. He carefully recorded his observations on the Lunar Checklist log sheets, which are available from the AL as a free download. Ian was awarded the regular observing certificate for observing and logging 100 features on the lunar surface. He also received this certificate for making 64 observations using only binoculars or the unaided eye. This is the lapel pin that is awarded for completion of either level of the program. Congratulations to Jim and Ian. I encourage all of you to check out the AL programs. They are very educational and help you by setting goals and giving directions to your sessions under the stars. Thank you for your attention. Okay, that was wonderful. Bill does a great job with his videos. And if you haven't, um, if you're new to observing and you want to sharpen your skills at observing, those observing programs are wonderful for sharpening your skills and learning how to observe um, with a focus. And um, you can download the information for free from the astroleague.org. I think that's their address. Um, from the astroleague.org website and get started. So um, a wonderful resource. Um, in the next few months, we're gonna be talking a lot more about the Astronomical League. So they're our parent organization. We are one of a few hundred clubs that belong to the Astronomical League. Okay, um, next up, we're going to start our show and tell presentations, which are 
the focus of this meeting. And our first presenter is Ron Rannick. If you would bring your items over here. He's just going to bring his table around, and I'm going to step away. Very good. Welcome, everybody, to uh, this month's Denver Astronomical Society monthly general membership meeting. My name's Ron. I'm going to talk uh, during tonight's show and tell about something that I spoke spoke about during one of our previous show and tell events quite a few years ago. And it's the idea of standardizing the connectors that we use for our DC power interconnects. Um, when we go out observing with our telescopes, many times those telescopes have motorized drives on them. We may use computers and other components and devices that require some type of external DC power to operate. And they have a mishmash of connectors and adapters and you know, how do we connect everything together and hook it up and then if we want to loan somebody a camera, uh, then they may not have a compatible uh, cable or connector to power the device um, for their use. The, uh, the ham radio community, uh, that's another hobby that I belong to, and, and I think for those of you who know me, you know me, I'm very much a geek. Um, the ham radio community has largely standardized on something called the Anderson Power Pole Connector. Um, I have some examples of these connectors here on the table. Um, in particular, the Amateur Radio Emergency Service is a nationwide organization that supports emergency communications for a variety of survey agencies during disasters, uh, whether uh, natural events or whatever, um, have standardized on this for interconnecting ham radio equipment. I, I um, standardized on the power pole connector several years ago for my ham radio gear and then decided you know, I should probably do the same thing for, for all of my astronomy gear. So every, pretty much everything that I use in astronomy that, re, that operates off of a, an external battery or DC power source has now been standardized to the Anderson Power Pole Connector. You can buy these things online, uh, but you can also buy them locally at the local ham radio store down on, on East Evans or Isle, if I think it is, just off of I-25. Um, but what I brought tonight is a... Is a partial collection of some of the cables and connectors that I have. So this is just an extension cord, but you'll notice the little black and white connector on the end of the cable. That is the Anderson power pole connector. Now, interestingly, these things come in much larger sizes for other applications, but for this size, it's these little guys right here. They can handle up to 40 amperes of electrical current, which is rather substantial. So conventional extension cord here, and you'll notice that it's fused. Um, this one has an Anderson power pole connector on one end and has spade lugs on the other end, so you can connect this to a power supply or battery or something else. In fact, I brought a battery, and you'll notice that I have a little jumper connected to the battery with the power pole connectors on there. Want to hook up to a, a cigarette lighter plug or socket? You can do that. And there's the power pole connectors for that. If you want to be able to hook up to just about anything, put a power pole connector on one end of the cable and big alligator clips on the other end of the cable. And if you have a device that uses a special connector itself, which is pretty typical, then you take that power cord and leave it as is so you can plug it into that device like a camera or, or laptop. And the other end, you put the Anderson power pole connector on. And you start to see a trend here and you think, well, okay, what if I've got more than one device I need to hook up during an observing session? That's easy. This is a DC um, distribution box. Uh, this is the smallest one that this particular company makes. They make them up to, I think, a dozen or 14 outlets. They're all fused. So you plug in, say, in this case, the battery to the input connector, and then you can hook up uh, up to five different components on the output of this thing, as long as you, of course, you don't exceed the, the overall current capability of this, which is 40 amperes. Connectors come in bags like this, so they come with the little spade lugs and the black and white terminals. The spade lugs that go on the wire, um, the terminal itself is the same on all of them, but they have different uh, design on the crimp type to fit different gauges of wire. So you can go up to larger gauges of wire like eight gauge or, or 10 gauge wire, or down, down to small gauge wire like 18 gauge or even 20 gauge. And then to put them, put everything together, you want to get the good crimper. There are some cheap crimpers out there. Do not get them, get the good one. Um, believe me, this is a whole lot easier, um, particularly when you've realized that the cheap crimper just made a, a real nice intermittent connection and you're wondering why things don't work. So do it right. And I will demonstrate how easy it is to put something on. 
me pass this around. This this shows an example of what all these look like through the different stages. So let me set this down. And see if I can get this done without uh, making a fool of myself. And in the interest of time, I'll just put one connector on rather than the pair. So to further save time before I came down here tonight, I, I prepped the end of the cable. So all you want to do is cut the end of the cable square with wire cutters, split it apart about an inch, and then with the red wire on the right side facing away from you, take one of the spade lug terminals with the curved part facing down, put it over the exposed copper, Put this in the crimper, make sure it goes in the right one. This one had this one supports three different connectors: the 15 ampere, 30 ampere, and up to 45 ampere connector. Okay, the terminal has been installed. That will not come off. It's not necessary to solder anything. And the next thing you do is drop the, the plastic housing. Pick it back up, and with the connector end facing away from you, you slide this in, press it in till it clicks. If I can do that, there we go, that's done. And when you're making a connection like this, after it's done, put these together. Red to red, black to black. And that's it. Sweet. Very, very easy to use. Questions? Is there a male and female to those two? Nope. They're the same. Interesting. How much does a good crimper cost? Uh, the good crimper is about 60 bucks. The cheap crimpers are about 20 bucks. Believe me, it, it's not a good thing to use the cheap crimper. I tried it, and they 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 will result in intermittent connections. Not might, they will. So get the good one. Other questions? All right, that's it for me. I'm just going to take the mic since we're going to have presenter after presenter. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Ron. That was very nice. Uh, next up, Chris Mullen. All right. So what I'm going to demonstrate is a little educational tool I've been working on. Um, all it is is this. Um, it's a set of individual mirrors. Uh, pointed in different directions. The idea is that we take this to a uh, high school or junior high or a college class and help teach optics with it. Because um, what's surprising about this is that each of these is basically a little camera. It's a, um, it's a thin little camera. And so what's, what uh, you can do with it, if I have my light shining the right way, which I don't. It help if somebody helps it. No, it actually helps it to be uh, is in a consistent play. What would help if we could turn off some of the room lights. Not everyone, but a good portion. So the idea that I, that I wanted to explain to get across with this is that um, it's a tool that people can use. Um, actually, I got inspired by this by an article on Universe Today that said, hey, you can use a um, disco ball to help share images of a solar eclipse. Uh, because each um, mirror on a disco ball will give you a different image of the eclipse. So this is kind of the same thing, but more specialized to uh, uh, put all the mirrors on one side. And, and then we you can go further and do things the shape of the mirrors. So, um, I don't think we're going to get the back line back. It's okay. So we'll get more lights out. And I don't know if this is going to come across for the people at home or not. We can get closer. Well, it's a, it's a matter of uh, contrast and um, 
So what I'm doing is I'm following at one of the reflections from the from these mirrors. So uh, if you can see that um, through the paper, you can see some dots on that paper, right? It, all right, so you can see some dots. And each one of those becomes an image of your light source. So this, of course, works better when you have a bright light source like the sun. Um, if you use the sun shining through uh, the branches of a tree or through some object, you'll see the those branches show up in these images. And you can have each student have their own reflection and then follow it out and see more and more detail because the images get larger and larger as you get further and further from the pinhole. And then people get surprised by some of the optical effects. So for instance, one uh, of these mirrors is square. Most people think, oh, a square mirror is making me a square reflection, right? But no, it's a pinhole. And so once you're at a certain distance from the pinhole, it is really the structure of the um, of light source that you're seeing, not the structure of the pinhole. Uh, similarly, I've got some long, narrow mirrors here in different orientations, and they will give you better resolution um, across the direction where the narrow air, um, uh, dimension is, and a less resolution, more fuzziness in the long direction where the, the wide direction is. I'm afraid I'm not able to demonstrate this very much because there's just not enough contrast and we're getting enough, you know, light from the screen behind me. Um, and of course, light in front of me. So, and as you get further and further, the image is going to get bigger and bigger. Um, it gets dimmer and dimmer because it's just, you know, same number of photons over a bigger area. And I envision um, teachers using this to have students do their individual measurements of like what that magnification is, how fuzzy is it, how does it differ with the different directions. Uh, and even thinking about trying to put a gradient on a couple of these to uh, spread out the spectrum of the light source. Um, so I think there's a number of optical principles that can be demonstrated with this. Uh, if you want to try to play with this later in the dark corner of the room, I'd be happy to show it to them. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Greg. And, you know, I recently sent you an email about uh, making presentations at some of the, at, at least one high school. Maybe this would be a good one for that. Mm -hmm. So, all right, I'll let you extinguish your light there too. Oh, good idea. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next up, David Schwartz. Uh, you can just come and we'll get set up with that PowerPoint on my computer over here. I think we can just switch back to the audio over there. So I'll hand you this. Okay. There you go. My name is uh, David Schwartz. Uh, my partner, Elsa, is not here today. Uh, she's unfortunately sick, but um, I'm a student at DU. I'm a physics major, math minor, and astronomy minor. Uh, Elsa is an English and astrophysics major at DU. Um, we're huge nerds about space and uh, have a really large compassion for um, our DU community and especially the Denver astronomy community. And so uh, we had an idea of like, well, <laughs> To go back, if I know you guys have all probably been to Observatory Park. There is a student observatory there. It's like people call it a baby observatory. It's kind of off to the side. Uh, it's been shut down for many years. And um, Elsa and I had the same vision of actually restoring it so the students could use it again. And this is a proposal to do that. Um, so here we go. So this is the overdue overview of the presentation, just kind of like what it's going to look like, not caught off guard. Um, just. Our inspiration and overview, obviously the obstacles of our project, our plan of action, product, and end goal. So pretty simple stuff. And so what is this all about? So we have our baby observatory was actually the first building ever built at DU. Uh, so it definitely has some historical background being built in 1892. And um, fast forward to today, the observatory is, to say the least, beaten up. And I have a lot of pictures of the inside. So you get to see that as well is very exciting to go in there. Um, so we're two very ambitious, astro ambitious astronomy nerds, and um, we didn't see like what a lot of people see, which is a jungle gym or a place to put your garbage. And uh, we saw a lot of opportunity, and we thought, what if we could fix it? And um, how would that benefit the community? How would that benefit us? And how would that benefit the DAS? Okay, so... 
to start, um, we created a project proposal and a petition at the school. Uh, one of the excuses we heard that it wasn't restored is because there wasn't enough interest and that it wouldn't have enough big of, a big enough impact at DU, which was complete BS to me. So um, I decided to make a petition, and I'm not terribly social, so this was extremely draining. I got 350 signatures from students and 16 uh, signatures from professors, and actually 100% of the people whom I pitched my idea to said yes, which is, you guys are scientists, so 100% is a big deal. <laughs> so um, yeah, they're very enthusiastic, and uh, we've actually ventured into the observatory and uh, taken images and thought of potential problems that could arise. Um, so, so the next um, slides will briefly explain our idea. Okay, so our um, sorry about that. Doesn't like me. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, it's great. I love it. Okay, here we go. Back to where we were. So, the plan. Um, our plan is to restore the student observ observatory back to its former glory or even better. Um, by, stem by spending weekends here at DU or a summer, um, we would continuously work on remodeling the um, observatory. Uh, it's a really small observatory. Um, I mean, it is very small. Um, <laughs> so it's not a humongous project. Um, in the pictures, I'll explain why it's not as bad as I thought. Um, originally, I thought the place was just empty. But um, anyways, to get back to this. Uh, so a good thing about this is that we're not going to pull any funding from the DAS. Uh, we're going to pull funding from DU because they have plenty of money. I know that because I spent my money going there. So <laughs> uh, the, the members of the DAS will be used as experts, uh, people to help. We had a member, Bill, reach out, and he was like, "We would lo I'd love to help you with your project. Sounds great. Um, he knows what he's doing, to say the least. So uh, DAS would be knowledgeable people we can contact. Um, we will be the keepers and maintainers of the telescope. Another problem I heard is that, obviously, DAS is short-staffed. Um, I've had about a dozen students come come to me and say they would love to help and that they would love to learn. And I think that would be a great idea because it's literally called the Student Observatory. It was made for students to learn how to manage a telescope. So that's a good thing. Um, so we wanted to make the uh, Student Observatory available like every weekend. I'm in astronomy class with Dr. Hoffman. She's not here to get, she's not here today, but um, she is a whiz to say the least. And um, she's going to help us out with that. And our, our, uh, I'm, we're in the astronomy class, like I said, and it would be great to be able to use a building with a uh, telescope. So this is what it looks like from the outside. Um, yep, it's tiny. And so just in case you haven't seen it, and um, <laughs> this is kind of what it felt like going into it. If any of you guys are Indiana Jones fans, you can relate. Um, fighting off snakes and whatnot. Oh, not this again. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, this is interesting. <clears throat> okay, where is it? Okay, not to deviate. So, um, this is a picture of the doorway open. Um, if any of you guys are any woodworkers, I was raised by a very, very good carpenter, so I know my way around wood. So um, this is an image of, like, the. it's kind of interesting. So you can see there's stairs here. How, how tall is that doorway? Oh, I'm six foot, so that doorway is, like, six three. Uh, okay. It's bigger than you think, but it's kind of a squeeze to get in here. But uh, a problem that I thought of is, like, what if there's mold? What if there's termite damage? What if I step on the floor, I fall straight through and die? Um, that's not a problem because this wood is in fantastic condition. Um, you can tell just by the color that it's in really good shape. 
Um, normally wood that's gotten water damage, dry rot has turned gray. Um, you could literally squeeze your hand through it. This is extremely healthy wood. Um, there was an, an, uh, there was an uh, attempt to restore the observatory. Okay. Keep slogging me up. So um, there was an attempt to uh, restore the observatory uh, in the 90s, and it didn't go all the way through, I think because of lack of funding. Um, but you can see there's a couple things in there that I can show you. Like I said, I I'm pretty sure that the foundation or the where the wood is, is um, has been redone because it's extremely new, unless it's just in great condition. This is the actual telescope. Uh, it's kind of painted funny. It looks like R2-D2 to me. But um, uh, it's, it's all there. It's got its lenses and everything, and I think that's where the DAS would come in a lot, is their expertise with telescopes. I believe it's like a six and a half or seven inch refractor, so it's pretty big. It's nice. Uh, here's the track. Uh, they did put in a motor, kind of funny, and they just kind of throw it on, threw it on there, uh, so that the the actual roof will pivot like the large one, which is really cool. Um, very interesting. So this is the dome. It looks super cool on the inside. It's all ribbed like an old ship. Uh, there are pieces of the wood that are all the woods kind of starting to crimp up. That's because of um, normally humidity and it drying and low temperatures, and it's in really rough shape, and the whole place needs to be repainted because the paint's peeling. A problem we also have to confront is there's a possibility the place is painted with lead paint, so don't want to die while you go in there, so we're going to have to test it and then strip the entire building. Um, this is the, uh, I forgot the name, but so there's the dome, and then there's the smaller part of the building in the back, and there's like this funny room that has <laughs> this giant nest of some creature that's living in the roof. Um, I'm kind of afraid of that part, but uh, uh, it's actually really interesting. Apparently there's a box in there with journals and books from uh, someone who was working in there. And uh, so there's a lot of history behind this building. Obviously needs to be fixed. And to go... It's the transit room. There yeah, the transit room. There was a scope in there that disappeared back in the 80s. Yeah, I, I, uh, Bill sent me a thing on it. He said it was stolen in 1965. Mm -hmm. So someone needed a transit telescope, which is interesting. So um, some obstacles we have, obviously, is time, uh, funding, labor, hazards, experience, um, unpredictability. Obviously, at confronting any project, especially restoring a building, it's going to be dangerous. There's always going to be problems. But, I mean, that comes with everything. And I think, obviously, as people who admire space, uh, there's going to be a lot of things that are going to be in your way, but it's just your job to push those things out of the way in a safe manner. It's exactly what we're going to do. Um, so the benefits, obviously we can have a lot of experience having students from DU work on the building. Um, inspiration, I, one of the reasons why I wanted to be an astronomer was because I saw this guy with my dad one night and he just blew me away. We wanted to have accessibility to all the students. We wanted growth in people's minds around space and the DAS, as well, obviously, the benefits of the DAS, public and university. And we want to do what others won't and can't, um, because obviously no one has restored it yet, and we want to do what no one else has. It has a huge, massive potential to inspire and do exactly every single one of these things and more. So I'm very excited about that. Okay. <clears throat> So the plan. First, we need to get the green light from DAS. We basically need your guys' permission to do this project. And um, I mean, some of you guys might think it's a no-brainer. Some of you guys might not. Uh, so we want to hire professionals like members of DAS. Obviously, if we run into any problems, we can hire professionals like surveyors to check the foundation and things that obviously rookies can't do. Um, we want to locate blueprints and documents to uh, like confront problems that there might be. Um, we need to make a project cost analysis. I would love to just throw a number, but I want to be honest and give a good one. Um, so we would actually have to clean up the place, look at it, look for the problems. You know, you can't just like look at something and be like, I need this much money. That's, that's not right. So we will start by start the rest restoration by replacing wood and just any foundational components of the building. Easy stuff. Um, Harbor Freight Home Depot. Uh, your typical dad weekend trip. So 
Um, we're gonna, we'd love to restore the dome. The outside of the dome's in really rough shape. It's got just kind of peeling paint. We want to get the paint matching to the other observatory so it looks real pretty. Um, and we want to ensure that the interior is safe and comfortable to use, obviously, because if we want people, yes. We have a hand raised in the audience online. Uh, I can save questions for the end. Okay. Is that okay? Very good. Just let him know you'll, you'll answer his question. I will answer your question at the end, I promise. Okay. okay. <laughs> So last, um, we will have an open house for the refurbished building at the, like the grand opening. We'll crack a champagne bottle on the place, and we'd love to reach out to journalists and spread awareness because it's a really awesome thing, and I think that uh, journalists would love to eat that up. So blah, 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 in depth. So restoring anything is going to be hard, and it's going to take money and labor, period. Like, that's a given. So receiving funding from the school and using our time efficiency uh, – and obviously using help from students around you who like lend a helping hand would be a great way to finish this project and see it through. Um, so a way I look at restoring things is like you have a road with something at the end of it and you just have these roadblocks in front of you. And each one you take away, no matter how slow, is just one step closer to that end goal. Um, and that's just, it's not as hard as you think. It's all a mind game sometimes. So. Um, Elsa and I are going to take the job on as the fixers, so we're going to do all the hard stuff. And um, we're going to uh, – well, obviously, the DU, is going to, the DU is going to help us fund, which is amazing. And we already have funding lined up from a student – or a board at DU has offered to give us funding, which is fantastic because we're already kind of slowly stepping there. Um, next, our funding plan. So as I already mentioned, we have funding lined up from the school. Uh, once we're allowed to clean the observatory up, we will be able to invite our experienced members of the DAS to give us their wise wisdom and tell us what we need to fix. Um, so there's actually electricals in the building, which is great. That saves us a ton of money. Um, and we can draw up an estimate of like how much money we're going to ask for. As you see, money equals good. So in the unlikely event that funding opportunity falls out, um, we also have other opportunities, which is great. So um, the university has a ton of opportunities for students that are looking to like boost the university, make a club. They got plenty of money to throw at you. So, um, we have that. And in worst case scenario, we can go out to the public. I don't know if you guys have been there, but there are some pretty freaking big houses around that park. <laughs> and if we go door to door and give them puppy eyes, maybe we can get some money out of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> So cost of benefit, the number of stuff, um, having entered the building, I'm really relieved. Uh, it's not as bad as I thought. Um, either I was expecting a huge spider or nothing to be there, but it was, I was super happy. I was smiling so much. So um, let's see. I won't know, obviously I won't know the definite cost until more ex extensive inspection is done. But the benefit of this project goes beyond us. I would love this project to be passed on in generations of DU students to where one day we can look back and be like, wow, this building was built in 1892 and it's still being used. That would be fantastic. So um, obviously improving the observatory from, will make it less of a target for vandalism. It's kind of like a rock climbing wall now. So <laughs> hopefully cleaning it up and putting it in use will scare away those rodents trying to uh, crawl around down it and so our product of a restoration is uh something that's going to be beautiful and beneficial to the entire community um we want to restore the observatory and make it a place where people can explore the sky which is a very beautiful thing as you guys know so we hope that through the expertise and support of the das community as well as funding from the university of denver we'll be able to restore the student observatory back to operation which would be fantastic, beneficial to all of us, not just us and you. And so the future of astronomy thanks you. Ta-da. Um, that's the end of my yakking. I need to hear what Rick has to say, and I'll answer any questions. Feel free to contact me or Elsa if you have questions or if you want to lend a helping hand. Just ask him to unmute. Okay, Rick, you can unmute if you want. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. So really good idea. Love the project. Um, from a sales and marketing perspective, your slide 21, uh, I would suggest putting that up toward the beginning of the presentation to DU. 
Uh, what's in it for me? How is it going to benefit people? So sell the vision first, and then the details of how you get to the vision will come along. Okay. Um, another note uh, on the on the dome. Yeah. Um, it's probably a pretty old dome. Yeah. Would you be open to looking at? Gee, does it make sense to repair this old dome or get or put something in its place? Just the dome, not the building. There's yeah. plenty of commercial domes out there um, that we could put in its place. Yeah, I asked myself that question too, and it's just how much money do you is willing to give us? So um, I don't know. I was kind of thinking of numbers. Um, I mean, we would probably need a much bigger one to replace the dome. Um, I think most of the money is going to go into nice paint as well as redoing the grout on the outside of the building. Um, that's also if we, we don't come across any major problems. So, uh, oh, right, yeah. and just cost-benefit analysis, what's it going to take to restore the existing dome to operational use? You mean like number figures exactly? Oh, well, no, no. So I'm not looking for an answer now, but rather being open to, oh, it's going to cost us X number of dollars to repair and restore the existing dome versus... Uh, replacing it with something that's more modern, perhaps more longer lived, has better features. So just doing the cost benefit analysis between the two options. Yeah, that'd be a good idea. I mean, to open like the, so the observatory has that kind of front part you guys are probably familiar with that opens and then you're able to pivot and you, that's where you like are able to see it's like a slit. Uh, you open that with like a bunch of little pulleys. They're like this big. And uh, so, yeah, a new a new uh, dome would be awesome. And I mean, that's I'll just have to see where that goes on funding. All that junk. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Any questions here? Yes. Uh, how is DAS related to this? Your first item was getting permission from DAS. Yes. Yeah. So. Um, basically, I talked to Dr. Hoffman, and she says, so technically, DU owns the observatory, but like, I'm kind of bad about it, to be honest. Um, uh, but the DAS, uh, she said technically is in charge, so we need permission from them to be able to fiddle with it, and then we get money, and then we can fix it up for you guys. So David and I had a talk about this, and <clears throat> I said that our... Our concern is primarily Chamberlain Observatory because that's where we do our public outreach, up in houses, public nights, um, and DU has their astronomy classes there. So um, I don't see any problem with them going forward with this. In fact, if the student observatory is refurbished and becomes the primary training place for students, then it might actually relieve pressure on the use of Chamberlain. And because Dr. Hoffman is always asking us if we can use Chamberlain more, if we can have more public nights. And the only way that that would happen would be if we could use it maybe on Monday and Wednesday night instead of, we. I think they would still need it for classes, but if they could do their observing, in the student observatory, maybe that would help. I don't know, we'd have to see where that goes down the road. There is one thing I want to tell you though, there is a person in this room who probably knows a lot about the student observatory and that's Dan Ray. You All need right. to talk to this gentleman about the student observatory. All right. So I, I recommend you go to him. Um, anybody else with questions here in the room about this proposal? Let's go here first. Could you speak up a little bit, please? Sorry. I can't hear you. My wife's a professor at DU, so I may be able to also help with raising this. That'd be fantastic. Thank DU. you. But um, I was wondering if you had had a discussion with anyone about historical status of your building. And if there is any type of registry or anything, it might be much more complicated to get permission. You'll probably know, <coughs> but there's a lot more paperwork involved. Yeah. It's really unstructured. May be free and clear because it's just the university mm -hmm. uh, But I didn't know it. you had looked into that at all. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's very historical, but uh, to say the least, there wasn't a single student who knew that it existed. So, um, <laughs> Uh, yes, obviously, uh, Dr. Hoffman mentioned that. She said that it could be a problem or something we have to go through is that it's a historical building. And that's something I'm going to look into. But um, like from what I've seen, that's probably not going to be a problem because, I mean, 
if you're going to be picky about when someone comes to fix it, why are you not picky about when it goes to waste? So, um, yeah, question? I was curious, what exactly, what university board is, are you getting funding from? Is it just from like the physics and astronomy department? Um, actually, that was an interesting story. So while on my large track of getting signatures from students, there was a kid who mentioned that he was a part of a board. I forgot exactly which one, but he said that they had rollover funding and they were interested in investing in students who were trying to make the uh, Denver campus a better place. And so I was like, you're the best. I'm really glad I asked you to sign my petition because that was a, it was a huge thing. And uh, so shockingly, no, it's not coming from physics. It's actually coming from a uh, board in the University of Denver to make the Den yeah. Denver a better place. So. Is there an astronomy club that would serve as a group of people to you know, organize things and maintain the tribal knowledge and pass it on? And yeah, um, I mean, on? there's a lot of astronomy classes. That's something I need to look into. Um, uh, Hoffman also, she's been a like the uh, holy grail in this whole thing. She just she's leading us through, and she's our goal, and she's helping us so much. And she said that making a club or just getting as many students interested as possible to help follow it through. Because obviously the more bodies you have on a project, the less likely it is to fall out. Yep. And I know we have, there's, so at DU, there's a Society of Physics students. Yep. At DU, but I don't think there's, they are the ones who do a lot of observatory events and stuff like that. I don't think there's, I, I, and I know because I was asking about the astronomy club, <laughs> but like I don't think there is a direct astronomy club, but generally the Society of Physics students. Yeah, I'm a member of the Society of Physics students, and uh, they're really great kids, and um, they don't really do a lot uh, with observatory. They do have telescopes, um, some Mead telescopes that they take out, but no, they don't really do anything with the observatory at all. Okay. Yeah. So then you might want to consider the uh, alumni for not only uh, contributions, monetary, but maybe in-kind services, like an engineer, mm -hmm. absolutely, an architect, and maybe somebody in preservation, if it turns out, you know, it's not a national register or something. Yeah, that'd be great. So Chamberlain Observatory went through a major restoration um, in the early 2000s, and um, we, I believe that we worked with History Colorado, is that correct, Dan? And so, um, I believe that if you went to History Colorado and talked to them about it, you could find out whether it was just the main building that was covered by their work or whether that included, I mean, I know no work was done on the student observatory, but I know that Chamberlain is on the National Historic Register. Yeah, yeah. You could find out if the student observatory is too. Okay. Yes, uh, Vince. You might, you might consider starting out by raising enough money from DU to do kind of a feasibility analysis. Yeah, absolutely. Because I've restored a couple of old buildings, houses, and buildings. Uh, and uh, anytime you touch anything old, there's always more surprises than you touch. <laughs> absolutely. And uh, so I think it would be a good idea to mention professional advice before you do it. Get too far into that. Absolutely. I think it's a great idea, but I just think, you know, from having been down the path of, you know, dealing with zoning boards and dealing with all those different people that need to put the rubber stamp on it, yeah. having a professional study, you know, and I don't, I don't know how much that would cost, but, but, you know, having someone who is a quote architecture and someone who is a lawyer yeah. looking at your plan and saying, okay, here are the things, you know, all of the boxes you need to check. And uh, that could be you know, four or five thousand dollars to get that done. So yeah. I would ask the, I would consider asking, uh, raising that money first. Absolutely, that that was that was that was part of what I was saying. Um, I just wanted to be able to see into the stuff because it's hard to see into anything when it's like cobwebs over your eyes. And uh, absolutely, I'd have to hold myself back from fixing it myself. But uh, yeah, I would definitely do a cost analysis before going any further. Absolutely. There are some comments here in the chat that we should look at. Uh, Jack Eastman says, originally the small observatory housed a six inch grub Dublin refractor circa 1890. Last I saw of the mount was in the Chamberlain basement. Tube assembly is currently writing piggyback on the Clark, the 20 inch Clark. Yeah. And last I knew Edgar Everhart, director prior to 
Oops. Good grief. Prior to stencil, had his 10 inch right telescope in the small observatory. Okay, all right. Uh, okay, so the share stopped and let me close this. If I can see how. Um, do we have any more questions? All right, well, okay. thanks for letting me give my whole spiel. I hope you guys like it, I hope you support. It's a really great idea, I feel like it could do a lot for the DAS and the community alone, so. Thank you very much, right. yeah. We wish you well. Okay, let's see. All right. Thank you. I am gonna minimize the view here again. Uh, actually, let me do one thing before I do that. Let me go to gallery view. Is there anybody online that had a last question or comment about this? Ah, I see your two thumbs up, Jack. Thank you very much. Don't see anything from anybody else. Okay. The last thing that is part of our, um, I'm trying to minimize this, is a video from um, Joe Pineda. So... Let me get that started. This is the last part of the show and tell. Still wants to show the other one. Oh, well. Hi, my name is Joe Pineda. I'm with the Denver Astronomical Society. And today I'm going to give you a show and tell about a homemade guide scope I recently made. I don't know if there's any way to increase the sound. The uh, desire for this design was to have a fast, lightweight, low-cost guide scope for my Celestron Edge HD 11 and my uh, cellar view refractor. Uh, I was looking for something on the order of 250 millimeters of focal length uh, because that's just simply what SharpCap recommends in their uh, uh, guiding, I mean their uh, polar alignment program. Uh, so that, that was kind of my beginning uh, starting point. I wanted it to be compatible with my ASI 174 guide camera I didn't want to have to uh, constantly play around with the uh, where I was mounting the camera inside the focus tube. Um, so my solution was to find an off-the-shelf achromatic lens assembly from Amazon and the rest of the uh, scope was going to be printed uh, on a 3D printer. Uh, and then I had a test of verification plan where I was planning to use SharpCap first to polar alignment. And what that does is it requires that the scope be good enough to uh, plate solve stars as and then finally uh, I was going to use PhD 2 to gauge the overall performance of, of the impact on if there was any on guiding. Uh, the tools I used uh, for CAD I used Autodesk Fusion 360. These are the same people that do the uh, Auto, AutoCAD. Uh, Fusion 360 is uh, sort of an enhancement of that. Uh, allows you to do 3D print designs. Uh, for the printer, uh, I picked a good one. Uh, it's not absolutely necessary to pick one this good, but it's, it, I picked a good one. Bamboo Labs X1C 3D printer. Um, it comes with a slicer program. Uh, the slicer program simply takes the CAD design, turns it into a language that the printer can use to print the file. Um, I spent about three months uh, learning to use these tools, and uh, it wasn't that hard. Uh, so one of my goals uh, with this maker sig that's coming up is to make it easier for the uh, the initiates into the um, into the sig to uh, so, sort of shorten these times and perhaps lower the cost of, of what they're trying to do. Uh, here's a sketch of uh, what I came up with. Uh, so I had uh, at the back, starting with the camera, uh, the camera would insert into a focuser, and I wasn't really sure at the time about the focuser, I felt that was a little bit too advanced for me, uh, followed by a tube uh, that would be the length needed to achieve the focal length of the, uh, uh, that the lens had, and then a lens, and the lens would just drop into the tube and a little lip inside the tube would hold it, uh, keep it from falling down the tube. And then the hood, the lens hood would be uh, 
basically hold, hold the lens in place. It would do two functions besides just being a hood. It will also hold the lens in place. Um, and that's basically it. So there wasn't anything really fancy about it. I wanted the, uh, the lens to be achromatic so that all the colors would come into focus at the same point on a focus. And I also wanted the uh, scope to be about an F3 or F4, fast enough to be usable as a guide scope. Uh, so what that meant is with a 250 millimeter focal length that was looking at somewhere around 70 to 80 millimeters of aperture. Uh, my design concept for the focuser, um, so the focuser is complicated. It has a lot of moving parts and I had never done anything like this before. Uh, but I did go on to a website called Printables and there are many, many of these types of sites where they have pre-designed components uh, that you can simply download and print. Uh, so in this case, the design wasn't exactly what I wanted, uh, specifically the base of the, of the uh, focuser, but the rest of it was pretty close. So what I did was I downloaded the design, I studied it, and then I modified the base uh, the black part there that's screwed into the, the telescope in the picture and modified the base so that it would meet my needs. So a word about licensing. Uh, this, the guy that designed this, uh, he's known only as uh, B-A-L-L-A-N-U-X. Uh, he decided uh, that the license, he didn't mind you using it for whatever you want, but he wanted credit for it where it says the X there, sharing without attribution. So here, herein I am giving you attribution to who actually designed that focuser. And then in his design, he gives credit to the original author that he modified um, for a uh, guy's name is Math. It's also on printables. Uh, that's an entire telescope if you're interested. That's 3D printable. And then for materials, uh, I had a, um, for, for the lens, I found the lens on Amazon. They have many such uh, like this, uh, different sizes and focal lengths. Um, for $91.99, uh, it's an achromatic lens, 280 millimeter uh, lens, it's achromatic. Uh, and as it comes, it's, it's basically two lenses that are uh, fused together uh, to get the, uh, uh, to get the uh, achromatic property. So this was what I needed uh, and I've used it and uh, works pretty well. And then for uh, the plastic, the, the 3D printed plastic, I chose an ASA filament, which is, um, uh, it's a type of filament that's good for outdoor applications. It's, it's got UV resistance and it's, it's good even when it gets wet. So uh, it's, uh, it's pretty good for that. It costs about $25, $26 a spool. Uh, and to make a single scope, you only need a few, uh, less than $10 of that filament to print, uh, print the scope. So I estimate the cost to make a single scope to be an even $100. Um, let's see. Uh, for other materials, uh, basically a, a tube of grease from Ace Hardware. Uh, this is for the, uh, the base of the, uh, of the focuser. I'll show you in the uh, Maker Sig how that is applied, as well as the super glue. The super glue uh, makes the focusing knob uh, captive to the focuser base so that it can't come off. Uh, and then finally, the bed weld. Uh, 3D printing is a lot like baking cookies. Um, you have to grease the pan when you make cookies. With, with 3D prints, you have to put a, uh, a temperature dependent glue on the base, uh, the, the uh, print plate. Uh, the build plate in the bottom of the printer. And what that does is it holds the, uh, the plastic that's being printed in position uh, while the uh, printer is, uh, is printing. And you'll notice that when you do this, uh, there's a lot of vibration in the printer. So it's important that the thing you're printing uh, does not move. So that's why. So the total for all that's less than 30 bucks. It's not a whole lot. So I have an image here of um, the uh, two parts of the more complex parts of the telescope. Um, first on the left is the tube with the Vixen dovetail plate uh, that's integral to the tube. In other words, the Vixen dovetail plate is not metal. It's actually uh, this ASA plastic and I've used it. I've had no troubles with it. It works great. You can see that both, uh, both ends of the tube are threaded 
and uh, as you uh, as you learn uh, Fusion 360, you'll learn that making threaded parts, even in plastic, is not really that hard to do. Uh, on the right is the focuser base. I had to build this from scratch. Uh, this the idea came from the the printables design I showed you earlier, but I wasn't able to use that particular piece, so I had to create this whole thing uh, uh, brand new. The rest of the parts from that design I was able to use as is. Finally, uh, the, uh, the print. Uh, this is just an example of printing the largest part, which is the tube. You can see the tube itself on the left and the Vixen dovetail being printed. The Vixen dovetail, for the most part, is hollow. Uh, and you might think that that would make it uh, crushable uh, when you put it in the Vixen vise uh, to hold it down. The fact is that there's a uh, there's a, what's called an infill. It's a crosshatch grid inside there that gives it extra strength as well as being lightweight. So that's very cool, um, and it does that automatically. It's not something you have to engineer. Finally, here's the uh, the assembly process. Um, I'm assembling it. It takes about two minutes to put together. In this video, uh, if you get good at it, you can probably do it in under a minute. I was doing this in the demonstration mode. So you see that the lens is sat on top of the lens hood and then I screw on the tube and the lens hood does the job of uh, holding the lens in place. And then the next thing I do is I put the dust cover on. It's a friction fit. And then I install the focuser base with the focuser knob and uh, I install the, uh, the helical uh, draw tube into the uh, focuser base. There is a little bit of alignment because the focuser uh, tube is not uh, does not rotate when you focus, so you have to line up the grooves inside the uh, the helical tube uh, with the uh, notches on the uh, on the base. And once that's done, uh, you just uh, turn the knob to draw the draw tube into the focuser base. Then you screw the focuser base back onto the other end of the tube. You'll notice how easy it is uh, with these uh, 3D printed threads to make all this work. I was a little amazed by that. I thought I was going to have troubles, but it wasn't that hard. That little colette there will be used as a friction fit for the a compression fit for the uh, camera. Uh, what I'm putting there now is the uh, lock nut. So once you have focus achieved with the helical focuser, that lock nut is used to secure the focuser knob in place so it doesn't move. The camera's uh, inserted. Oops, I forgot to put the uh, camera lock nut on. You twist down the camera lock nut until it's tight. And once it's tight, the camera is immobile. And you can see there that the camera is flush fit with the lock nut. I designed for that because I really don't like having that uh, guide camera moving back and forth. So, and then I shook it to make sure there was nothing rattling around. Uh, that's something you want. The total weight of the uh, at everything you see there minus the dust cover is one pound, 4.2 ounces, which is pretty good uh, if you look at some of the offerings online. So my goal was low weight, and I think I think I did a pretty good job achieving that. Most of that weight comes from the uh, the lens and the camera. So I've done what I can do. Uh, integration with the telescope. So here it is connected to uh, my Celestron 11 inch. Uh, you could, I have a uh, Vixen dovetail vise on the top of the uh, on the top of the Celestron and uh, so the moment arm created by the one pound uh, 4.2 ounce uh, guide scope is not excessive and actually uh, works better than most of the offerings you'll find online. Um, so uh, I was happy with that. That went off pretty well. Um, and far as test and verification goes, uh, the uh, I used PHD2 uh, for guiding a guiding test, and I used a sharp cap for polar alignment. So I used the guide scope for polar alignment. I got good results. I didn't have any problems with plate solving. Focus was good. Uh, everything worked nominally. Uh, sharp cap does seem to work better with a focal length about this this size. Uh, it's quicker as far as uh, polar alignment goes. And then uh, the PHD2 there, uh, this is with an 11-inch SCT. Uh, 
uh, the, uh, the right ascension axis of my uh, mount uh, does have an encoder on it, so it is uh, it is uh, precision. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, with good focus on the guide scope, I got 0.55 arc seconds RMS in this image. There were times during the uh, evening when I was playing around with this, I got less than 0.5 in the 0.4-ish range, 0.45, and that's the best I've ever seen. Uh, and a lot of that is due to the mount, but the guide scope did not add any error, near as I can tell. So I am happy, and uh, I'm, I'm pleased with the results. If you like what you see uh, in this uh, demonstration, I am standing up a, a new SIG called the Maker SIG within DAS. Uh, I put together a syllabus for the coming year, uh, but I mean, this is not cast in stone. What I hope to find out once members, uh, people sign up for the SIG, uh, is what is your skill level? What do you want to see? Uh, but, but doing this in the blind, I came up with uh, the first part of the uh, year I'll spend talking about 3D printing uh, and then uh, you know the, the details of how to manu manufacture, publish, and license your work if you decide to sell it or put it online for whatever reason. And then uh, I'd, from that point I'd like to uh, add some programming capability to or string some programming to our skill sets. Uh, I'm planning to use the Raspberry Pi 5, which just came out this month at the end of October. Uh, what's unique about this device is it has um, NVMe uh, connectors on it. So in other words, you can put a large amount of uh, memory uh, on the on the little uh, Raspberry Pi 5 board. That they can you can get these at Micro Center. Um, I think they're about 80 bucks for the Pi 5, um, and that's a quite a, a lot of capability for such a small small single board computer. Uh, for, for programming languages I was planning to use Python. Uh, it's popular for AI applications as well as uh, e easy enough to learn. It's If you've ever done any um, uh, what's the word? Object oriented programming. Uh, this should not be a, a big step to learn. Um, we'll print some cases and try to integrate this within our uh, uh, scope hardware. Uh, we'll practice putting uh, uh, Windows 10 or 11 on the, on the Raspberry Pi uh, and uh, what astronomy software we could then use on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, and then finally, uh, integrating it with the telescope and talking about electronically assisted visual astronomy. And as I said, uh, you don't have to do things in this order and we won't necessarily complete all these tasks by these dates. It'd be nice if we could but it's not absolutely necessary. So this is completely malleable, and uh, hopefully uh, you enjoyed this presentation, and thank you so much. Oh, boy. <laughs> so who's going to sign up for Joe's Maker SIG? Looks like a pretty industrious thing. Yeah. Yeah, somebody I, I heard say, boy, that sounds, I said something like, that sounds like an entire college course. And somebody else said, it sounds like three college courses. So definitely, that's quite a bit. Okay, let me go back to gallery view here. All right, uh, very good. So that is all we have for show and tell presentations. And that filled up quite a bit of time. This is, uh, I was kind of concerned when Joe put this back to show and tell for this year, because we haven't had one for a couple of years. And I was like, because, you know, it used to be all that people made stuff at home and um, the old fashioned way. Uh, Ivan Giesler back here, he, he used to make, uh, cook up quite a few interesting projects at home and bring them in for show and tell. And um, things are different now, but I'm really pleased with what we've had come in this evening. So thank you all of you who brought something to contribute. <laughs>